Hello, today we're going to review Unit 6 on thermochemistry by doing some free response and multiple choice questions. Okay, so we have a mixture of plastic beads consisting of polypropylene and polyvinyl chloride in a one liter beaker. After stirring, the student observes that one type of plastic beads sink and the other ones float on water. The chemical structures are shown below. And then um, given that the spacing between polymer change and, and polypropylene and polyvinyl chloride is similar. The beads that sink are made of which polymer and explain. So the, since the spacing is so similar, the biggest difference then is going to be uh, the difference between the chlorine versus the methyl group there. And the chlorine is much heavier. So that's going to make it more dense and have it sink in water compared to the polypropylene. All right, polypropylene is synthesized from propene and polyvinyl chloride is synthesized from vinyl chloride. Uh, the structures of the molecules are shown below. And the boiling point of propene is 226. It's lower than the boiling point of liquid vinyl chloride at 260 Kelvin. Uh, account for the differences in terms of types and strengths of intermolecular forces present in each liquid. Um, so you're going to see London dispersion forces in both of them because they're in, in every molecule. Let's so make sure that's one of your answers. You're also going to see dipole-dipole interactions for both of them because they both are polar. Now, vinyl chloride is going to have a larger dipole moment because it is more polar um, because of the chlorine's really high electronegativity. Um, so it draws the electrons uh, closer to it creating a more uneven spread of electron density around that whole molecule. So because it's more polar, it's going to form, it's going to form a stronger intermolecular forces, stronger dipole-dipole interactions um, compared with the propene. So that, that stronger intermolecular forces causes it to have a higher boiling point. All right, now we're getting into the unit six stuff. Um, we have a separate experiment, enthalpy of combustion of propene and vinyl chloride. Student determines that the combustion of two moles of vinyl chloride releases uh, 2,300 kilojoules of energy, according to this equation. Um, okay, and then we have using the table of standard enthalpies of formation. So this is enthalpy of formation. Um, determine whether the combustion of two moles of propene releases more, less, or the same amount of energy that two moles of vinyl chloride releases. And the balance equation for the combustion of two moles of propene is, there it is. Um, so, when we have heats of formation, the equation that you'll use is um, the overall heat of reaction is equal to the sum of the heats of formation of the products minus the sum of the heats of formation of the reactants, products minus reactants. Um, just make sure that you take into account the coefficients. So I need to add up six carbon dioxide and six waters add up two of the propenes and nine oxygens, although oxygen is zero because it's already in its standard state. Uh, and then you'll subtract products minus reactants. When you do all those operations, you get that the overall heat is negative 3,858 kilojoules per mole reaction. Um, so let me fix that. There you go. Um, we want to make sure that we're actually answering the question. It says, determine whether the combustion of two moles of propene releases more, less, or the same amount of energy than, four, uh, than two moles of vinyl chloride. Well, propene releases more energy than the vinyl chloride does. So this one has two points, one for um, correctly calculating it using the heats of reaction, I'm sorry, the heats, heats of formation, and the second point was for correctly um, stating that the two moles of propene releases more energy than the two moles of vinyl chloride. Okay, here's a different free response question. Um, and this one was a short free response question. A was worth two points, B was worth two points. Calculate the amount of heat needed to purify one mole of aluminum, originally at 298, by melting it. The melting point is 933 Kelvin, and the molar heat capacity is 24 joules per mole Kelvin. Heat of fusion is 10.7 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so I'm gonna sketch part of a heating curve here. So it's starting at um, a solid at 298, and it needs to get up to 933 in order for it to melt, and then it will melt. And that's what we wanna find the heat for, for both of those sections. 
So this first part, we can use Q equals MC delta T because the temperature is changing. And the second part, we can use the heat of fusion. Um, the temperature is not changing, but you're um, still using heat to break those intermolecular forces. Um, so let's do the Q equals MC delta T first. Um, we have one mole. So sometimes you'll see this mass in grams and then your specific heat given in grams. But in this scenario, they give us their heat capacity is in joules per mole Kelvin. So we can use moles for M. So really pay attention to your units. So that's 24 joules per mole Kelvin. So that way the moles cancel. And our change in temperature, if we subtract, is um, it has to increase by 635 Kelvin. So then the Kelvin cancels as well. Now, when you multiply, you get that Q is equal to 15,240 joules. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put that into kilojoules and use my uh, three significant digits there. So 15.2 kilojoules for that section. For the other part, the heat of fusion, I have a 10.7 kilojoules per mole. And there's one mole of aluminum. So that means it's going to take 10.7 kilojoules to melt it. So all I need to do now is just add the two together and I get 25.9 kilojoules total to raise the temperature and then completely melt the one mole of aluminum. And so that's two points for part A. One point for getting the um, correct Q from the change in temperature and one point for getting the correct overall. Now for B, the equation for the overall process of extracting aluminum is shown below, um, which requires less energy recycling the existing aluminum or extracting aluminum from AL203 and justify your answer with a calculation. Um, in order to accurately compare your answer from part A to this delta H that they give us in part B, we need to make sure that we're looking at the same moles of aluminum. So A is for one mole of aluminum. B, let's go ahead and look at that. Um, if, if we want to use one mole of aluminum to compare, in our reaction, there are two aluminums for every one reaction. And then we have uh, 1675 kilojoules for every uh, one mole of reaction. So we can convert that into just kilojoules now. And we get a 837.5, or just um, 838 kilojoules um, for one mole of aluminum. All right. So if we're comparing this number now to this number, um, definitely it's going to uh, require less energy to recycle existing aluminum uh, because that requires uh, 25.9 kilojoules to completely melt it, um, whereas part B, to extract it from aluminum oxide, it will require much, much more energy. And so that was two points, one for calculating the correct um, kilojoules um, or so, some other way of calculating and showing the difference um, in kilojoules in the correct um, proportion. Uh, and then the second point was for uh, correctly saying that the um, recycling in the existing aluminum requires less energy. Okay, so we have our overall equation here and our delta H value for that reaction. But the question is asking which of the values for delta H in the process are less than zero. And if it's less than zero, we know it's exothermic. Now, don't forget when you are um, breaking bonds, that's endothermic. And when you're forming new bonds, that's exothermic. You should also know for changes of state. When you're going from a solid to a liquid, solid to a gas, or a liquid to a gas, that has to gain energy. So that's endothermic. But if you're doing the reverse processes, those are exothermic. So for V here, if we're going from a solid to a gas, it has to gain energy. That's endothermic. Um, for W, K is losing one of its electrons. Um, and we call that actually ionization energy, but in order to break that attraction, that's endothermic. 
Same idea, we're going to break the bond between uh, chlorine and X. Breaking bonds is endothermic. Uh, for Y, we are attracting an electron to a chlorine atom. Uh, and it's forming a new attraction there. That's exothermic. And then the last one, we are forming a new bond between potassium and chloride ions. So that is also exothermic. So Y and Z is the correct answer there. Okay, same information on this one, but a different question. A lot of times you'll see that they'll give you one data table or one graph or one set of information and ask multiple, multiple choice questions about it. Um, this one, they give us a chlorine reaction here. And it says, which of the following expressions is equivalent to delta H for the reaction? Um, so we need to add up some of these to get it to equal this. So this is an application of Hess's law. And um, we want to make sure we have chlorine gas now on the reactant side, which so we can use X here, Cl2 yields 2Cl. Um, but we don't have two neutral chlorines in the products. We have two chloride ions in the products. Well, another reaction that we have is this one here, um, but we need to multiply it by two. So it's X, and then we have two chlorine plus two electrons yields uh, two chloride ions. And because we multiply the reaction by two, you need to multiply the heat by two, or the enthalpy by two. And then when we add them together, the neutral chlorine atoms cancel out. We're left with chlorine gas, two electrons yields two chloride ions. And your um, overall heat of reaction is X plus two Y. So it's C. Okay, so here is um, another portion of a heating curve. Um, we know it's a heating curve because of that step shape. Um, the substance changes from the solid to the liquid to the gas phase. So we know that this is uh, melting and this is vaporizing. This is solid uh, liquid and it's not quite to a gas. All right. Um, now it says, which of the following best describes what happens to the substance between time four and time five? Um, so we know it's vaporizing at the moment. Um, so molecules are leaving the liquid phase. Probably true. Uh, solid and liquid phases coexist in equilibrium. It's not that one because melting is down here between T1 and T2. Um, the vapor pressure of the substance is decreasing. Um, that is not true. The vapor pressure should be increasing because more and more of them are becoming vapor. Although we don't typically measure vapor pressure that way, so it's just not a good choice overall. Um, the average intermolecular distance is decreasing. Well, that's not true because more and more of them are vaporizing. Um, they're getting farther and farther apart. And then the last one, the temperature of the substance is increasing. That one definitely is wrong because we can tell on the graph that the temperature is staying the same. So it's definitely A, but it's always a good... Uh, a good choice to make sure that the other ones don't make sense. Okay, we have a 100 gram sample of metal. It's heated to 100 degrees Celsius and transferred to an insulated container containing uh, 100 grams of water at 22 degrees Celsius. Temperature of the water rose to reach a final temperature of 35 and which the following can be concluded. Um, so this is a classic like a calorimetry experiment. Um, the metal has its own mass and specific heat capacity. Um, so the 100 gram, uh, but it has its own specific heat capacity. The water also is 100 grams, but it has a different heat capacity compared to the metal. So the metal, because it's starting at a warmer temperature, is going to transfer energy to the water um, until it reaches thermal equilibrium, until it reaches the same temperatures. Um, so we know that the metal also reached a temperature of 35 degrees Celsius. Notice that the change in temperature was not the same. The water went from 22 to 35. The metal went from 100 to 35. Um, and that's because of the difference in heat capacity. Okay. So let's look at the choices. The metal temperature changed more than the water temperature did. Therefore, the metal lost more thermal energy. Nope. Um, the metal temperature changed more than the water temperature did. Um, but the metal lost the same amount of thermal energy as the water gained. Hey, that one looks correct. Let's look at the other choices. Metal temperature changed more than the water temperature did. 
Therefore, the heat capacity of the metal must be greater. No. Um, the greater the heat capacity, the more resistant it is to temperature change. Right, so the water has a really large heat capacity, which makes it a really good insulator. And then the last one, the final temperature is less than the average starting temperature, therefore the total energy of the metal and water decrease. Well, that's not true. The energy has to go somewhere. Uh, so it's definitely B. Okay, last one. Um, this is an example of a heat of formation question. Um, they give us the heats of formation for each of these things. We just need, need to know that it's um, the products minus reactants when we're dealing with heats of formation and use the coefficient. So you will do the 83 for the products minus 3 times the 230 for the reactants. And when you solve that, you get a negative 607, which is A. Um, because I didn't have another, one, another question about this, let me go ahead and um, remind you guys about bond enthalpies, though. Bond enthalpy is another application of this. It's another way to find an overall... Uh, enthalpy change for a reaction. Um, but instead of giving you like heats of formation, they'll give you bond enthalpies. Um, please remember that when bonds are broken, that is endothermic. When bonds are formed, that is exothermic. So when you give you bond enthalpies, it's bonds broken minus the bonds formed because forming them is exothermic. Um, so it winds up being the reactants because those bonds are broken minus the bonds formed, which are the products. So I just give you an example here where you're doing products minus reactants. That's for heat of formation. When you have bond enthalpies, you need to do the reverse, reactants minus products, because it's broken minus formed.